Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight's webinar, Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition in Practice. I'm Joe Cortese, co-president of the Chicago Booth Alumni Club and a principal and senior consultant with DeMeo Schneider and Associates. With me again this evening is Brian O'Connor, adjunct associate professor of entrepreneurship at Booth and founder and managing principal of NextGen Growth Partners. We also have two special guests with us this evening and I'll uh, ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment. So this is our fourth webinar focused on entrepreneurship through acquisition or ETA as uh, we affectionately refer to it. Uh, by the way, the links to our previous webinars in the series are available on the webpage for the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of Chicago. Um, and, and, and this uh, iteration, this fourth iteration, we'll be focusing on the practical aspects of ETA and, and, and sort of living the ETA life, if you will. Uh, we'll spend some time learning about what it's like to conduct a search from two people that are actually living it, uh, which I think will be very interesting. We will take questions along the way. You should all see the question and answer box uh, on, your, on your Zoom screen there, and you can feel free to enter questions in the Q&A box as we go, and, and we'll just uh, keep it conversational and try to get to as many as we can along the way. Uh, I also point out the chat function is disabled. So if you're trying to enter a question, don't enter it in the chat function. We won't see that. Enter it into the uh, Q&A, uh, so we'll be able to pick them up. Uh, one other announcement quickly, we will have at least one more uh, webinar in this series. Um, the next one will focus on the uh, transactional aspects of ETA and we'll, uh, we'll have another guest focused on the transaction side of things for uh, the next iteration, which will likely be sometime in late October or early November. So with that, I'd like to uh, allow our two special guests an opportunity to introduce themselves this evening. Really excited to have them here with us tonight. So Jake, uh, I'm gonna start with you only because uh, the first letter of your name comes before the first letter of our other guest name in the alphabet. So uh, please introduce yourself. Give us a little background about how you landed in the spot you're in today. Yeah, thanks Joe. Um, happy to be here virtually. Um, how did I get to NextGen uh, as an entrepreneur in residence? Um, prior to Booth, uh, like all you guys, a Booth alum, of course, um, but prior to Booth, I was in uh, political campaigns. I was in a, um, an educational startup, and I worked in a real estate investment shop that had a social impact focus. So a very cross-sector uh, kind of background. Um, and wanted to come to Booth for you know any number of reasons, but that's not what this conversation is about. And actually, as I was coming, uh, I had already applied and been accepted to Booth uh, the summer before. Um, I was talking with a buddy of mine who mentioned this concept of of ETA, and I thought this sounds like the craziest freaking idea I've ever heard. But if I could get somebody to back me to do this, I would love that. I would totally do that. Uh, and so when I got to Booth, I realized that there's actually this really great ecosystem around it, clubs and the conference and uh, Brian's class, of course. And so I uh, got involved in all that as early as I could. Um, the, the club activities um, did a couple internships while in Booth, one of them uh, with Brian at NextGen, uh, working for uh, a guy named Rock Irvin, who is now um, a CEO. And then one in the summertime with one of the portfolio uh, companies of NextGen, um, MHW. And, you know, along that way, kind of validating if this was a path for me. Um, and nowhere along the way did, uh, did I, you know, decide I didn't want to do it. And more importantly, nowhere along the way did anybody else tell me I couldn't do it. So, uh, in fact, by the end of it, Brian, uh, you know, offered me a, a spot here at NextGen. So. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, Nick, would you do the same, please? Would you give us a, a little introduction and background? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, happy to be here. Um, you know, a kind of key piece to my ETA story that I always start off with is that I, I grew up around a family business in Ohio. Uh, so it was a landscaping company, tree nursery, wholesale retail, kind of landscape design. Um, so I always kind of Know, tell the background that it would I would feel like it's in my blood a little bit, you know, um, growing up with the messiness of a family business and understanding what 
enterprises of that size, uh, the challenges that go along with them. Uh, after undergrad, I spent seven years in consulting. Uh, you know, I enjoyed a lot of things about a quickly growing consulting group, but uh, you know, I got to the point where I was one step away from becoming a partner, and I realized that uh, spending the rest of my career in a consulting firm uh, was going to be a little bit more bureaucratic than I wanted, at least with that firm. Um, I wanted something more entrepreneurial. I wanted to be able to have a much larger impact on uh, customers, employees. Um, so I really started diving into the entrepreneurship through acquisition options. And uh, for the longest time, I thought that I was going to go down a self-funded route uh, because I wanted all the autonomy. And then uh, I met the next gen team and uh, was slowly lured away uh, from that thought. Um, and yeah, I've uh, now been here for uh, nearly six months. Uh, it's been very exciting. Great, awesome. That's very, that's very uh, helpful. Thank you very much. So let's let's dive in here. I wanna I wanna start with just kind of level setting of where you both are today. You know, again, well, this is the fourth webinar we've had in this series now, so we've covered some of the basics about you know the different types of uh, search models and you know um, some of the things that you think about when you conduct the search and targeting an, an industry and narrowing things down. So what I, what uh, what I'd like to start with is kind of where you are today and uh, in, in your search or, or uh, with, with the industry that you're in and kind of how you got there. So Jake, maybe we'll throw it over to you and, and start there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the longest tenured uh, EIR at, at NextGen at the moment. I'm uh, 14 months in. Um, so, you know, I wish, uh, I wish I wasn't still here. I would rather still, you know, I'd rather be uh, operating already. Um, I, I'm sure you say that in the lo in the lovingest of ways. <laughs> with nothing but love, yes. I I love my my next gen colleagues. But, well, we, uh, we we have an we have an alignment of interest in that you know it's great to have our EIRs at the firm, but really what they want to be doing and what we want them to be doing is getting out and leading yeah. uh, companies that we acquire. So we are we are aligned in your in your goal here, Jake. <laughs> Leaving the nest as quickly as possible, really. <laughs> just means uh, you're being judicious in your search exactly that's what i like to think too uh so um i, I think part of the question was uh kind of what i've been looking at maybe what i'm looking at now right yes. um i you know through these 14 months have cycled through a bunch of different industries and and i'm sure we'll get into that more but um i'd say there have been a there have been a few that i've spent more time in because i've I've particularly enjoyed them and I've, I've probably gone deeper. And then there have been a bunch beyond that um, that I've kind of cycled through quickly and looked at one-off opportunities in. Um, at the moment, uh, kind of as it happens, I am uh, looking and, and kind of poking around a thesis um, that I kind of define as um, workflow automation. So it's uh, a lot of businesses, both software and uh, service-based businesses that, you know, facilitate the automating of uh, tasks and workflows within a business. So that's anything from, a, you know, someone that provides a, um, a content management, you know, software uh, to uh, an accounting back office that helps them, you know, close their books faster to, um, you know, a buzzy kind of word is like robotic process automation, um, which can do any number of things according to the guys that sell it. Um, so that's been a, a thesis I've been looking at probably for the last couple months, um, talking with a bunch of business owners and trying to kick something up there, um, but nothing, uh, nothing bought and purchased yet. Is, is workflow automation specific to a particular industry for you, or is it more about the concept of workflow automation and you can take that into really in any industry where you find a need or an opportunity? Yeah, this is, I would say, um, as, a, as an application, it's more horizontal. Um, so it's not, you know, not limited to a specific customer base, though as I've learned more, I've tried to identify those those businesses that that do have, uh, you know, at least from a sales and marketing perspective, a defined 
vertical that they go after. Um, I've found there's a lot of young companies in this space, perhaps not surprisingly. And so some of them are just sort of trying to source opportunities wherever they can, find customers that'll take them. And I think the, the smarter uh, you know, strategy here is to really own a vertical and be known as the workflow automation business in healthcare or insurance uh, or financial services. You, know, you can think about some of the, the low hanging fruit verticals that have a lot of you know, regulatory or uh, kind of information governance related tasks. Hey Joe, it was a really, that's a really insightful question that you asked around the business model in the end market. I mean, and that's, that's re- that is how we think about the development and pursuit of thesis at the firm is really where we can find the intersection between an attractive business model and an attractive industry or end market, right? So Jake was describing sort of a business model, right? We started to talk about some of the end markets. That's, that's actually exactly how we think about it at the firm, where an attractive business model intersects with an attractive and growing end market with some tailwinds, and Jake mentioned some regulatory ones there, um, but there are a whole, whole sorts of tailwinds, whether they be uh, regulatory or demographic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, that, that, that's pretty much exactly how we uh, think about thesis definition. And we've talked in prior sessions about, you know, some of those attractive business model uh, attributes and some of those attractive industry attributes that uh, one might think about incorporating into their approach when they're defining their thesis and area of focus. So great question. And, and Nick, what about you? Let's, um, I'd like to hear from you about kind of where you are today, how you, how you got there and what you're thinking about and looking at. Yeah, uh, so as I said earlier, I've been here for closing in uh, on half a year now. Um, now, I guess searching for those first few months because I launched April 1, uh, April was a pretty tough search month. <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I don't know, do those still count as months? Yeah, but like <laughs> Not really. it was brutal out there. Um, you know, I think there's kind of value in these discussions to show some real vulnerability about, you know, the, the difficulties of the process. And I have uh, a pretty open wound right now because my first executed LOI, we just killed it last week. Um, so there's a fair bit of heartbreak around that. But honestly, I, I've learned uh, a ton through that process. Um, you know, Drill down up, on that for a second, if you wouldn't yeah. mind. What, what was the... What was the business you were looking at? Why was it attractive to you? And, and um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, so in stark contrast to Jake, you'll notice that I really prefer these unsexy blue collar recurring maintenance services. <laughs> so these guys were just fixing parking lots, um, potholes, um, resealing, they'll stripe and you know they'll fix a sidewalk. Um, and ultimately, in due diligence, we uncovered what were going to be some pretty significant headwinds to growing this thing into the future and what could have been some pretty serious risks that ultimately we couldn't get comfortable with, right? Um, so, I mean, look, uh, I've never actually spoken to a searcher that closed their first LOI. I've spoken to lots that, that closed their second or their third. Uh, so it's like a known learning step that you kind of have to go sure, through sure. that uh, that initial pain, um, you know, I'm trying my best not to sulk and still be very productive right now, but. <laughs> hey, hey, Nick, an interesting data point, maybe from uh, on that particular topic from maybe you, Nick, and, and you, Jake, you know, um, we've talked about pipeline management in this uh, ETA series, and we don't need to, you know, no, no, you don't need to pull up the CRM and, and give the exact number, but like roughly, you know, speaking, how many opportunities have you sort of like, you know, business owners have you reached out to? And then how does the funnel sort of narrow to, you know, taking a, a, a call or a management meeting, indication of interest, letter of intent, just maybe just some highlight um, stats. I do know the exact numbers just because I created, <laughs> I had to slice the data for a different uh, speaking engagement recently. So um, I know that in the six months, I've reached out to uh, si- about 6,500 prospects. Uh, I've received 350 positive email responses. Uh, that obviously does not count all of the um, go screw yourself 
responses that I also received. Um, I've re submitted uh, nine indica indications of interest and I've submitted three letters of intent. So. Wow. With, with one of those, with one of those three executed. That's correct. Right, right. The funnel narrows pretty quickly. Jake, do you have just high level, you know, uh, stats similar? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers uh, showing me up over here, Nick. Uh, I could look in our CRM, but I will not uh, bore everybody with that right now. I, I do think though, I want to say we talked about this in Brian's class back in the winter. And so I think back then I was around maybe 30,000 uh, outbound, um, you know, emails essentially. Um, it's only gone up from there. Um, I think for, you know, for context, similar to Nick, right? We, we probably, I get really excited if we get like, you know, a 10% response rate to an email. And of those 10% that respond, as Nick said, you know, a handful of them are, uh, go screw yourself in, you know, probably meaner words sometimes, which is shocking as a side note, you know, you'd think like people would be more flattered, but they're, well, why they're it would not. take the time to respond. Exactly. I mean, it also, I don't get that either, but hey. Um, so, you know, you get maybe 10% respond to that. And then, um, and then it's a much a smaller number from there that are actually uh, businesses of size and who are real sellers in our eyes, you know, because there are a lot of folks who are, are eager to, you know, the ones that aren't mad that we reached out, there are folks that are pleased and happy. Uh, and in fact, really excited to just sort of uh, have a conversation and maybe get some market intel and get a free valuation on their business, but have no real intention of selling. So, um, so that funnel does narrow real quick. Um, over these 14 months, I mean, I think my, I, I don't know at this point, even how many kind of management meetings or conversations I've had. It's been many, um, have submitted, I don't know, 30, 40 IOIs maybe, um, have submitted probably, I think the last count was 10, 12 LOIs. Um, and in contrast to Nick, I, I have not had one executed yet. So, you know, hopefully Nick is wrong and maybe my first one I do get closed, right? <laughs> we actually, we're getting a couple questions here. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, for those in the audience, um, some folks are asking some questions about, you know, what is the process for being selected as an EIR? Are EIRs compensated? More sort of nuts and bolts. I would encourage you to reach out to the folks at NextGen uh, and Brian and, and his firm to get those questions answered. That's not really the scope of this discussion. Um, but we do have a question from Tyler that asks about uh, at what point do you decide to stop actively pursuing a sector or a thesis um, and move on to another one? And so that's a good question. I'd like to get your thoughts on how do you, how do you sort of um, deal with the fact that you need to spend time on something, but you, clearly you don't want to spin your wheels on something that's not going to be effective. So Jake, maybe we'll stay with you and have you talk a little bit about that and then we can get Nick's perspective as well. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll be curious for Nick's perspective because I think it's a, it's a really tough, uh, it's a tough thing. Um, you know, we, the, the balance in this entire endeavor is um, time and effort versus uh, kind of depth of knowledge, right? So um, I, I mentioned that there have been a few industries that I've probably gotten to know more deeply. I, I think this workflow automation idea is one. I, I spent a while looking at um, uh, cell tower infrastructure businesses, kind of thinking about the future of 5G and, and what that might entail. Um, and there were one or two others where I, I really spent a few months having a lot of conversations um, really look at a lot of different businesses and, and learning as much as I could. Um, then there are also other industries where um, maybe I just spend a week and I kind of build a list and I do a little high level looking and I send out a ton of emails and, and I just say, hey, if something pops from this, I'll go deeper. But until then, I'm not really going to get invested. 
Um, so this workflow automation example, I, I'm kind of at that breaking point, and I've talked about this with Brian and Nick in the office. Um, I've sent out a lot of emails. I've probably pissed off a lot of people for having sent them like eight follow-up emails. And, and I continue to just not really find a great fit, uh, either because they're, they're too small or because they are in fact too quickly growing and they have huge pricing expectations. So I guess the answer is it becomes kind of a feel thing. You know, you sort of start to feel like, I don't know how many untouched, you know, folks are out here. Um, and the rest of my pipeline is starting to look lean. So I need to go kind of cater to that. But it's tough. It gets emotionally tough because I, I feel like at this point, I really, really like this industry or this, you know, set of companies. And I'd really love to buy one. And, you know, I sit here and I'm like, man, come on. Someone give me a workflow automation company for six times. Um, unfortunately, they want six times revenue and not six times EBITDA. So that's the problem. Say, uh, you know, it, it's a life finance one of the things, Gerald, that I'll, I'll just add is that we found um, some good success in is taking a thesis that becomes tired. You know, we've sort of reached the end of the internet on, on a particular thesis, and we believe that we've scoured as much as we can and all of the various tools and resources that we um, use to try to, you know, get in front of business owners. We've just sort of exhausted it. You know, we put occasionally put a thesis on the shelf for a while. And just sort of say, like, let's give that one a breather. And, you know, a few months go by and things might change in that industry or, you know, whatever. And or, or, or COVID happens and the world is sort of a completely different place. And you pick that thesis back up, you dust it off, you, you know, work on refining your list and some of your criteria again. And, and maybe you even uh, send a, a different type of message or a, a different type of um communication as opposed to, you know, just email uh, to that same audience or same audience plus or minus 10 to 20 percent of, of, of sort of the original uh, recipients of the cadence. And uh, we've had some good success with that. We've had some things that just sort of with a little bit of time and, and breathing room uh, create some, some opportunity. And Nick, what about you? Why don't you provide some context there from your experience? Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. So I think what Brian was hitting on there uh, with all of the historic theses that are out there that we can go and look through, I mean, that was kind of the first thing I did when I joined NextGen, right? Like there are 200 plus um, scorecards out there that uh, smart people well before me had researched and, and looked through. And I thought that that was uh, a really great spot to just hone my own investment thinking. Um, you know, when it comes to the creation of a new thesis, uh, I think we always have a group of interns that are kind of backing us and working on additional research tasks, um, building lists, designing communication strategies, uh, prepping for, um, you know, owner calls. Um, I feel very lucky to be working with all of those smart people as well. Um, and kind of within their process, there are a couple go, no go decisions on any thesis. So, you know, we come up with an initial idea, we track it on a community board. Uh, when someone, when an intern team kind of takes it off to, to start looking at it, you know, the first thing that they look have to look into is, is it a recurring service? Is it mission critical? And is it serving a growing in market? If it fits those three and we, believe that the sources where we're pulling this information from is adequate to then invest time to fill out an industry scorecard, then that industry scorecard is probably gonna be two to three days of work. Uh, after that scorecard is created, we have another go, no-go. Look, like if we have identified risks here that just mean um, it's going to be dramatically overpriced, okay, we may still send an email because we may find a diamond in the rough. Um, are there fundamental issues with the revenue dynamics? Okay, we'll probably cut bait. <laughs> um, and then, okay, let's say that, you know, it makes it through those decisions. Uh, we send emails to uh, industry experts and business owners. I, I've still had cases where after speaking to business owners, 
issues are identified that we did not understand when we filled out the scorecard or in our initial research, and uh, we cut off, uh, we don't send any further emails, right? Because um, a typical process is that, you know, uh, at least for myself, the first email, you know, we hit send, and then afterwards our automatic um, email communication sent with pre-built templates that are intelligent and customized to each recipient. And look, like if we know that we're going to be hitting a brick wall, I, I don't want to spend any more time and I don't want to consume um, any of those business owners' time. So we, I would stop the communications. A question that's come in along those lines from Troy. Do either of you or both of you set regular targets and sort of goals to accomplish on a weekly basis? Like I need to send this many emails out or this many IOIs per month or how do you organize your own workflow? Let me start with you, Nick, and then we'll, we'll get Jake sure. Um So <laughs> my, uh, we, we definitely do have uh, next gen set goals that we meet and discuss uh, every week. Um, I have personally set a goal for myself that I hold myself accountable to that's uh, even higher. Um, just because look, like before going down this journey, you, you end up speaking to a lot of searchers, right? So essentially what I tried to do is out of you know the 35 searchers that I spoke to, where were all of their levels of communication at and therefore where can I set my goals to hopefully make my search as close to foolproof as possible. <laughs> so uh, for me, I, I aim for 208 new prospects identified per week. And if you back into that, uh, if you take two weeks off per year uh, and so you're working 50 weeks per year, 208 times two years, you end up at 20,000. Um, which if you contact 20,000 prospects by, by communications or just discussion with past searchers, it's really difficult to, to not close a, an attractive business. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, uh, hoping for, you know, two IOIs and one LOI uh, per month, but that sometimes is, you know, difficult to do. And then there'll be another month where you somehow submit three LOIs and, you know, a two-week process two week uh, period so what does that look like for you jake yeah i um uh somewhat similar i admire i admire the way nick thinks about it i think my my brain works a little bit different sometimes but uh, on a week by week basis i mean i i think he touched on we have kind of month and quarterly goals on a few different measurements but um at a bare minimum, I'm trying to have 20 calls with owners every week. And I, I sort of, you know, on a, on a fundamental level, right, if you're, if you're having phone calls with actual business owners, my hope and prayer is that one of those at some point is going to turn your way. So um, in addition to the kind of email metrics and, and outreach numbers that Nick mentioned, just getting on the phone um, is the key. Yeah, I mean, I, just my two cents. I think both Nick and Jake are fantastic with thinking about their goals and their metrics and how can they continue to drive for better activity at all sort of levels of the funnel. The ones that are most important, important, you know, to me, I think that searchers or anyone, you know, pursuing the ETA path should be focused on, and, and you guys hit it well, are, are conversations with business owners, you know, qualified conversations with someone that owns a business that you might want to buy. That, like, that's one. Second is um, letters of intent, both submitted and negotiated to execution. Um, as Nick pointed out, you know, not every executed LOI closes, right? I think, you know, if you look at private equity data, I would suggest that about a quarter of LOIs that get executed turned in turn into um, actually acquired businesses. Now, uh, Jake, I, I, I have reason to believe that you know you'll 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 be sort of one and done. Uh, but I think that um, you know submitting LOIs, negotiating them, and ultimately ex executing them, along with qualified conversations with business owners, are really the two that you need to uh, be most most focused on. You know, one thing I'm kind of wondering about, um, I guess I'm a little surprised to hear that sort of email outreach is 
perhaps maybe the first step in the process. And the reason I'm surprised about that is just because with, you know, filtering firewalls, I mean, I know just in my day to day, I have problems with my emails getting through to the right folks. Is that something that I'm sure it impacts what you're doing? How do you think about that and deal with it? Um, Brian, I don't know if you want to start or Jake, whoever, like, or Nick, whoever. Yeah, sure. I, I can start. I mean, a couple things. So we do use um, a handful of technologies and we've developed a handful of processes at the firm that we believe help mitigate some of that and, and help maximize the chances of us getting a communication through to a business owner and actually having it land in their inbox and them being sort of compelled to open it and read it and knock on wood respond. Now, a good cadence though involves other, um, other touch points as well, right? There are, you know, direct mail, there's, there's picking up the phone and dialing, there's tracking someone down at a trade show that you know that they're gonna be having an exhibitor booth at. You know, we talked, I think about in a, in a previous session, Joe, some of the, you know, sourcing tactics and methodologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about a, a lot about emailing, right? Because it's the quickest and most efficient way to try to engage someone in conversation. But my belief is a, a good cadence includes a whole number of different um, sort of touch points. I make the joke that if you, you know, if you get a, a, a you know, a, a really good prospect that you find, you know, spend a couple bucks and send them a fruit basket around the holidays, anything to, you know, sort of get a conversation with a business owner that you think might be willing to engage with you and sell you their business. Those, as Nick and Jake shared the stats with you, those are, you know, few and far between and hard to come by. So when you find something that you think you know, you might have an engaged and willing seller on the other end and it's an attractive business, um, latch on in whatever way you can. I guess the dating analogy is fairly apropos. Yeah, Jake, uh, Nick, anything to add there? Just handwritten notes. I mean, like a well thought out handwritten note um, has a ridiculously high response rate. It goes a long it, way. It yeah, it doesn't need to be anything overly complex. I mean, I always try to send my, my notes with like a particularly unique stamp to like hopefully get their attention. But other than that, it's just a thoughtful kind of dialogue and then just putting your name and phone number at the bottom. And, you know, I have right around a 50% call rate from that. Um, so. Anything to add there, Jake? Um, probably not. I mean, I think it's just as a lot of things are in this process, it's a trade off um, of sort of volume and, and time here. I mean, you can't, mm -hmm. you just can't send 30,000 handwritten notes, right? Um, so, or send 30,000 fruit baskets, we would run out of budget pretty quickly. Um, but is it worth doing when you find those right ones? Absolutely. Um, so we're I think just echo Brian, we've tried to experiment with a lot of different email techniques. We have tried to mix in calls, mix in LinkedIn outreach. Um, I have not yet tried to stalk anybody on like Facebook or Instagram, but I don't know. I'm not above it. Maybe I'll try that soon. Um, Whatever yeah. works, I guess. You know, hey, yeah. Joe, we've spent a ton of time and we don't need to necessarily drill into this, but like we've spent a lot of time talking about proprietary, you know, thesis-driven sourcing where you're reaching out to and campaigning directly to business owners, there's this whole other, other universe of what we do at NGP and what searchers do in whatever path that they go down that does rely on, you know, investment bankers and brokers and wealth advisors and attorneys and accountants for, you know, introductions, right, facilitation or intermediation between a buyer of a business and a seller of a business. And the nice thing about that channel is, you know, if a seller's engaged a broker or an investment banker, you know that they're for sale, right? <laughs> so, so much of what Jake and, and Nick do is trying to find that proprietarily sourced deal where their story and who they are and what they intend to do with the business resonates 
with the business owners such that it compels them to engage in a conversation around the sale of their business with Nick individually or with Jake. And so as to sort of circumvent or avoid that business going to market, you know, with a, with an investment banker or broker. And and I'll tell you that we, you know, at the firm, we, we do a little bit of both. You know, we, we do have a pretty well-defined um, database and methodology for interacting with uh, bankers, brokers, intermediaries, and developing deal flow in that channel as well. So I, I just really don't want the, the, the listeners to our conversation today to sort of be like, oh my goodness, this is the only way to find a, a, a small business for sale is to, you know, try to find a needle in a haystack with some of this proprietary sourcing. But I, I will say um, of all the businesses that we've bought, most of them have been done in this proprietary uh, sourcing type of way. We are of the belief that the best businesses at the best values are in, in the right fit with the right sellers are, are on, often come out of those proprietary sourcing efforts. But um, people transact on businesses that are represented by brokers and bankers all the time. Thank you for that. I was going to ask you kind of what percentage of what you've done thus far has been proprietary versus versus a third party source, but. Um, yeah, I mean, that vast, vast majority proprietary. Interesting. You know, we might get into a, we might get into a thesis and, um, you know, with a platform investment and then uh, make add-on acquisitions or consolidation a priority and, and, and brokers and bankers can be helpful in that context. Um, um, or, you know, finding, on occasion you can find a, you know, something that's interesting that could represent an entry point uh, into a new thesis. But the vast majority of what we do at the firm is, is um, thesis-driven proprietary. Uh, do you have another question here from Jay, specific to customer concentration? How, how often does that kill a deal? And, and, and we talked a little bit about this previously, but maybe from a practical standpoint, Nick or Jake, have either of you been down the path with a particular business and then said, uh, there's just way too much concentration here and got to find something else. Uh, maybe we'll start with Jake and then we'll go to Nick. Short answer, yes. I mean, often, you know, there's, I think there are cases, there are cases to be made and I, maybe Brian can speak to, you know, I think some deals that have gotten done where there was a little higher concentration than we would have liked, but there was enough to mitigate that. Um, but on a day to day, yeah, I mean, I, I'll see a lot of businesses, you know, there's, um, a lot of younger businesses, right. That are understandably growing, uh, by latching onto one particular customer. And, um, if I see that, um, everything else about that business better be pretty darn attractive. Otherwise I'm going to, you know, probably cut bait pretty quickly. Nick, do you have anything to add there? Yeah. I mean, I think. The worst example that I ever saw was uh, a single business that had 94% of its revenue from a single customer. And I mean, look, right? <laughs> More of a subsidiary. <laughs> I, I, I have to be very selective with the business that I'm like betting the next leg of my career on. <laughs> and like very confident that I'll be able to grow it and continue growing it. I mean, they had, um, they had just renewed like a three year contract with this customer, but Look, I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's just no way that I, I would be willing to kind of stake my career on that being a success, right? Yeah, I, and I, I, so a couple, a couple thoughts. Customer concentration is 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 really it's not it's not binary, right? It's it, there's a there's a spectrum of customer concentration, and whether you look at the top account, the top five accounts, the top twenty five accounts, you can measure customer concentration um, in a in a number of, of sort of different ways, and which leads me to my, my second kind of point on customer concentration is it, it, it's one of many risks, right? Like, as I think we've talked about in this, um, you know, series, historically, no business, I don't care, large or small, is without risks. It tends to be the case that smaller businesses do have, you know, risk, you know, th risky elements to them that you need to figure out, you know, okay, throw everything into the blender and mix it up does this ultimately, you know, is this a good opportunity or is it, or is it just too, you know, is it, is it too risky? The, the final thing that I'll say about customer concentration is it, it's, it's usually pretty easy 
to identify early on, right? So, Joe, you asked the question around, um, the, we got the question from the audience around, you know, how often does it kill a deal? How often does customer concentration kill a deal? I would say it actually more often kills an opportunity before it becomes a deal, right? You know, we're not going extremely deep on diligence and engaging attorneys to close on a, you know, draft a purchase agreement and, and spending a bunch of time and money on an opportunity where we know up front that they've got, you know, 94% of their revenue annually is derived from one account. That's that's probably going to be a situation where we, uh, it, it never really kind of becomes a deal. That makes great sense. I'd, I'd like to uh, bring it back to a little bit more about uh, Jake and Nick, your experiences thus far, and particularly like, g give us a sense of some things that have surprised you, maybe good and bad, you know, kind of coming into this with, uh, you know, limited background on how this whole process works. Maybe kind of talk about some of the um, early, uh, um, uh, you know, misconceptions you may have had and, 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 and things that just sort of surprised you along the way thus far. Jake, you've, 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 uh, you've been at it longer than Nick. So let's start with you and then we can have Nick uh, uh, share with us as well. Yeah, I think um, a pleasant surprise has been um, how by and large, uh, I haven't had to um, establish credibility as much as I thought I would. I, I think I, I feared that Look, I'm a 32-year-old guy, uh, you know, a year and a half out of uh, out of booth. Uh, what the hell do I know about anything, let alone, you know, your specific industry? Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised that that owners have been a lot more receptive to that. And and don't get me wrong, there are some who you know will say that. I count that in the mean email column, um, sure. but. Uh, who are, you know, pretty quick to grasp, hey, yeah, okay, I see, you could bring value, well, you know, whether you know our industry for 10 years or 10 weeks, yeah, I buy this. So that was a pleasant surprise. Um, you know, that's not as much of an obstacle as I thought it would be. Um, I think what's been harder, frankly, and, and maybe this wouldn't be as hard for folks who have you know, have real substantial backgrounds in, you know, private equity, buyout, investing, particularly in the, the lower middle market. Um, I think just for me, the degree to which there's, there's so much that's gray in this process, you know, I mean, I think even as, as Brian alluded to with the, um, the customer concentration question, right? I mean, there's, there's so rarely a binary in any of these elements that, that you guys have probably talked about in these earlier sessions, right? The revenue model, the, the concentration, the growth, the size of the market, you know, all these dynamics that are really easy for us to talk about, but uh, in practice, identifying a business, you know, there's always kind of the, the outliers. It's easy to say, oh man, that 99% concentrated business, no way are we gonna touch that. Kill it and let's move on. Um, and then you'll see some businesses every now and again where you think, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And unfortunately, there's no way I'm going to be able to afford that. Uh, and then there's a lot of gray in between where you really have to think about what are the risks that we, you know, that we can deal with. We think we can mitigate at some point in the future, uh, but we're not exactly sure if we can mitigate them today. And um, there's just a, a lot of gray there that I, I kind of didn't expect. Maybe I was naive not to expect that. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, it was, it took me a while to, you know, decide on this path. And um, I, I really thought I did my best to understand exactly what I was getting into, right? Speaking to a lot of searchers. Um, I even went as far as to like set up what I thought were, you know, kind of standard operating procedures for every day to like make sure that I stayed positive and um, like level headed during what is, you know, everyone refers to as uh, an emotional roller coaster, right? Like the highs are so high. Like when you get off a phone call with a business owner, they just said that they had 30 million in revenue, five in EBITDA, you had a perfect connection, the timing is perfect. 
you know, it's a two hands up in the air moment, right? <laughs> and then when a deal just unfortunately hits a brick wall, because maybe it was something that the business owner didn't even understand, right? Like he didn't even understand that that was a, a risk or a concern. Um, you know, I, I thought that I was like completely prepared for that. And it, it, it's been more difficult than I kind of expected it to be, right? Um, and in, in some regards, I have actually felt like kind of lucky that it started off during COVID because, you know, my wife and I were at home, like she could see this all happening in real time. Um, because I think otherwise, like starting off a search and trying to communicate all of those emotions, it's kind of difficult, right? So um, it was actually useful to be, you know, in close quarters and for her to, you know, us to be going through the journey together, right? Because like, at the very beginning, uh, every time I would have a qualified business owner call, like I would text her and say, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona, um, <laughs> right? Pleasanton, California, right? And like, that got old. <laughs> um, but it's but hard like, not to do that, right, Nick? <laughs> I mean, it's so hard because part of this process is like, we need to develop the conviction ourselves that this is the right thing. This is the right thing for next gen. This is the right thing for us. And so your mind, it just has to go there a little bit, right? You have to believe that that's true. And then when it dies, it's a kick in the, in the you know what every time. Yeah, I bet. I mean, look, like the only way that you can be really good at searching is if you're authentic and really empathetic to business owners. So you have to be truly bought in. And unfortunately, like if you're actually that bought in, it's also difficult to not, you know, kind of start looking at the deal through rose colored lenses, right? Like remaining objective while you're truly excited and still trying to build a pipeline in the background. Um, it's a challenge. Great, great insights, guys, really helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, interesting question from Tyler. What's the ongoing communication style slash cadence among EIRs as well as between EIRs and advisors? I think this is really interesting. I, I didn't think of this, but yeah, how how much interaction do you all have with each other? And then how do you what do you how do you, how much do you lean on Brian and the team at NextGen? And what's the interaction like there? Jake, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have one part of the reason I joined NextGen was was for this very reason. Um, I knew, you know, having those same conversations that Nick talks about with other searchers that the idea of going through all this and like sitting in my office at home or the desk that's three feet from my bed because I live in a tiny junior one bedroom apartment sounded absolutely awful. Um, so I knew I needed to be around people and um, next gen's been hugely helpful in that way. We meet every uh, Monday as a full team, do a, a kind of full pipeline meeting um, we have one-on-one -on -one conversations with Brian every week to talk about both pipeline and, and non-pipeline stuff, you know, just how in the world um, my headspace is on any given day. Um, we have small group meetings with our, some of the other guys on the investment team to talk about tactical next steps on deals. We'll do that once, twice a week, maybe, maybe more as necessary. Uh, and then you know, you guys can't see right now, but um, we all sit within, well, normally within like three feet of each other. Now we're like six and a half feet from each other, you know, COVID and whatnot. Uh, but I turn around, I, I look at Nick and, you know, we're talking earlier today about, oh my God, I can't believe this guy responded with this thing. You know, like, what do I say back to him? Um, so we're talking in real time about, about all this stuff. Anything to add there, Nick? Yeah, I think I'd like to think that, you know, Jake just turns around, sees my face, and just immediately feels better. But, like, that's not the reality. <laughs> uh, but we are all sitting out there in, in constant communication. So even with some of the questions that we discussed earlier about, like, go, no-go decisions on a, an industry dive, we're all comparing notes and uh, debating best practices tomorrow morning. So um, we're, we're constantly in communication. I mean, I think the one, the one thing I'd add to that um, that you guys didn't hit on is that, you know, whatever model, whether it's, you know, a self-funded search fund or sponsored search with, you know, NGP, I think surrounding yourself with, you know, your, your, your network and your um, and, and advisors, right, and investors. So, Nick, I mean, an example 
that I would cite is, you know, the deal that, you know, we went to Cincinnati for, and, uh, you know, last week we, you know, uh, did a management meeting in person, sort of socially distanced outside, which was the first time I'd done that, not via video since, you know, early March. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool, but, you know, you had one of our investors who serves in a advisory board capacity come along right to the, to the meeting and he, you know, flew in for it. And so I, I think, you know, you guys do a great job utilizing the advisors and the network around you. And I think that it's important um, in this conversation to talk about um, or at least acknowledge uh, the importance of those people, those investors and those advisors and those, you know, uh, the, the people in your corner um, when you're exploring these opportunities, um, whatever model it is that, you know, you, you whatever path you go down. I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm glad we kind of started to go down the COVID path a little bit too, because I, I, you know, clearly we're all still dealing with um, with uh, the impacts of the pandemic. And I, I did want to ask, how has that changed things for you and, and uh, your search? And how do you think it's going to change things going forward? Or, or what may, or what sort of COVID impact will remain, you know, two, three years from now after we're sort of back to normal, if you will? We're spending a lot less money on plane tickets, that's for sure. Fair, fair. <laughs> Same with our firm. <laughs> yeah. um, Nick and Jake, why don't you talk about the specific implications on your search and connections with business owners? You want to yeah. Up? yeah, yeah. Uh, I think first and foremost, right, it just dramatically changes the tone of communication, right? I mean, you start off with, um, is we hope that everyone is safe and healthy. Um, and you're just being empathetic to that business owner and what their business is going through and the hardships that their employees are going through and how they can, you know, work through all, all the challenges of bringing employees and customers on site. And, um, you know, I, I've never searched in a non-pandemic world, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's a pretty unique opportunity to show that we can add value by you know, providing lessons with how we also helped our portfolio companies through it, you know, and trying to be, you know, consultative with finding ways for us to actually help them and kind of provide value when in most other circumstances, we, you know, may just come across as another buyer, you know, given we have uh, the, the entrepreneur angle. But the reality is that I think if you're empathetic, it does give you a really unique opportunity to, um, you know, create a relationship and, I think, you know, it, when you look at the businesses that have been negatively impacted and the businesses that have been positively impacted, um, there's a sweet spot of places where, you know, we think we can still be really, really successful with, but um, it does change the lens with which you look at uh, industry ideas and um, the companies that are identified after that. Jake, your thoughts? Uh, I would just add, a. Uh, I mean, would echo, you know, March, April, May sucked. Uh, that was just uh, coming from a guy who had been searching in a, in a non-COVID world uh, and who frankly felt like he was hitting a stride right as we uh, marched on into the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic. Um, so that was a bummer. But all that's true, right? Just the difficulty of getting an owner who was willing to give you the time of day to talk and who was thinking seriously about selling their business in that moment was really tough. That's changed somewhat. I think that the, the overall mood has changed a bit. Um, maybe just to add to what Nick said though, I think the other element that we do have to deal with here is um, the financial implications, right? I mean, at, a, at the end of the day, right? We tend to think about businesses on kind of a trailing 12 month you know, performance basis. And then we think about the future and how we kind of marry those two. But um, nearly everyone was affected in some respect. And to Nick's point, whether that was a negative or a positive, it does add a little bit of wrinkle into what we think is sustainable into the future and therefore how we value the sustainable, you know, level of profitability in that business. And so I think if 
it can work both ways, right? Sometimes the business has seen a drop, but of course that business owner doesn't think his business is worth 20% less, right? They think it's worth the exact same number uh, and they don't give a damn about a, a TTM, whatever that means. Um, and, and that business owner that's jumped 20%, uh, you better believe they think it's worth 20% more now. Uh, whether that 20% is going to show up next year or not, we, we don't know. So that is another wrinkle here. You know, I, I, I don't think we have an easy answer for that. We try to, you know, figure out different ways of structuring deals. And, you know, it sounds like maybe there's another uh, ETA discussion on that. But, um, yeah, that's a reality here, too. That's added to the complexity of an already complex situation. Brian, has it changed anything for you at the firm level? Um, or what, what other lasting impacts do you think the environment that we're in today may have? Yeah, I mean, I think that during the early days, sort of during the second quarter of 2020, um, if, if the, the pipeline was just, you know, it was slower to fl th flow through the funnel, right? We were, any business owners that we were engaged, you know, in, in the discussion about buying their business, we needed to take a step back and say, oh my goodness, is everything okay? And we took a very, uh, like Nick said, a very empathetic approach um, toward, you know, trying to be helpful to those business owners and, um, you know, sharing with them some ideas and some best practices that we were uh, adopting across our portfolio companies. Um, Pipelines, you know, it's come back. I would say it's still not sort of where we would have been in September of 2019, just from a number of opportunities that are coming through and executed LOIs and deals that were marching uh, toward the closing table. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's coming back. I mean, we, you know, we think, and it's starting to prove out uh, that the business owner that might have been holding on for a premium valuation and it's just, you know, kind of experienced their business in an upside down world and their financials may have a bit of a negative impact as a result, or maybe they've, you know, been just fine through it from a, you know, Jake, to your point, from a TPM standpoint, but I think it has changed the mentality of sort of not wanting to live through something like that again. So the business owner that maybe historically wasn't inclined to have a conversation about, a sale of his or her business, um, you know, we're starting to engage in those with, with those folks uh, at, at valuations and structures that uh, may make a little bit more sense for us. But it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's slow in coming back for sure. But we're, you know, we're, we, and, and Nick and Jake are, of course, but as a firm, we are very, uh, you know, sort of excited about the opportunities that we think it will uh, present in, you know, the latter parts of this year into 2021 and, and 2022. Well, believe it or not, we've hit the top of the hour here. That went by extremely fast. Um, Nick, Jay, thank you so much for being with us here. Um, Brian, thank you for being with us again as well. Really appreciate the insights. I think this was really a fascinating discussion. It was great to hear some of your personal experiences. So again, thank you so much. Thank everybody uh, that joined the webinar tonight. Really appreciate everyone's attendance. And again, the replay will be available on the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of Chicago website if anybody's interested in tonight's webinar or the previous ones that we've had. And look for us again in a month or so with our next iteration where we'll dive into the sort of actual uh, deal process and structure process in a little bit more detail. So again, thank you everyone very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.